I have uh, been on a series. You know, uh, one of the things that God has been speaking to us is about revival. And uh, let me just introduce to you, uh, thank you, uh, about this series. I'm doing that. Pastor Lam has his own series, which he will present during uh, Rosh Hashanah celebration. Pastor Lam has been writing a book on revival in Sabah. Very enlightening. You will be challenged and inspired. And, uh, and so the Lord's been speaking to me about revivals. We are very, very clear about it. And I have a series of four. Uh, I hope I can finish before the end of this year. The first one, the first one that I did was how to sustain personal revival. You know, revival needs to start with us individuals. How do we sustain that? And remember, I took it from Acts 3, 19 to 21. Acts 3, 19 to 21 has been my favorite passage this season. You know, and there are three R's. The first R is repent. Repent is not a one-time thing. It's a hard attitude. And uh, this season is a season of teshuva. Hebrew teshuva means repent. Repent means, now this is, uh, 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 I'm, I'm walking this direction and I know it's wrong. God is correcting me and he wants me to change direction. So I will have to say, sorry Lord, this is not the direction. I need to change towards you. And uh, that's teshuva. That's repent. Means a change of mindset, a change of direction. It's a hard attitude and it has to be repent. Repentance has to be the key for revival. God has to connect, convict us personally of sins in our lives and that is blocking revival. Then second word is be refreshed, remember? And uh, we have three Ps for that, purity, passion and power. If you want to, you really look back at that sermon. The third P, uh, R is be restored. And so, those are keys for revival. That was the first session. Then, in the process of it, uh, as we were considering this whole thing about revival, September 16, last year happened. Last year, 2023, is a significant thing. When September 16 occurred, it happens to fall on the Feast of Trumpets. This is the second time. Second time, our country anniversary falls on Rosh Hashanah, or Feast of Trumpets. And uh, what is the significance for it? It so happens that it is also the jubilee of the 1973 revival. 1973, 2023. It's a jubilee, right? A jubilee means it's a reset. God is resetting things so that his original design comes to pass. And so, as we ponder about that, we are asking the question, Lord, why are you putting uh, the Feast of Trumpets in our anniversary again, second time. The first time is 2012, 2023 again. And uh, as it unfolds, we believe that it's the jubilee of the 73 revival that he's sounding the trumpets. And so we are very clear, very sure that revival is God's heart for Sabah and the region. You believe that? Wave to me if you believe Revival is here. Revival is coming. God is resetting that and uh, 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 bringing about an atmosphere of expectation for that. And so, today I want to look at my session two is riding on the waves of revival. I want to give you the biblical blueprint for revival and what we are expecting. The third session is going to be uh, during Rosh Hashanah. I'm speaking on how to steward and pastor revival because that's important for revival to reach its destination. And the fourth section, fourth one, is going to be how revival can impact society. Uh, 
looking from a biblical perspective of how things go. Now, when we're talking in advance, okay? Revival, how does revival, how can we engage God to see revival continue until it reaches its destination? Unfortunately, history tells us that a lot of revivals never reach its intended destination. They die off within the church. Revival should not stay within the church. But most revivals stay within the church, did not get a chance to go out. Let me explain a little bit of that things. Because the enemy didn't want, doesn't want it to continue. And uh, it will stop it prematurely. And if, but looking at hindsight 50 years ago, looking at revivals since the early church, we have uh, the benefit of hindsight and the lessons that I learned from, we can learn from it. So we wanted to ask the Lord, Lord, how do we steward it? How do we pastor revival when it comes? Because when it comes, you cannot talk about it already. You've got to address the issues that are there. And so before it comes, how do we expect it? What do we do with it? And uh, how do we steward it? So today, I want to look at riding on the waves of revival. How do we ride? When revival is here, how do we ride on it? The first thing I wanted to say from scriptures, if you look at <laughs> Jesus is the best example of revival, right? He came to bring the kingdom of God to revive people, to break free from sin. Before Jesus came, who did he send? John the Baptist. So I want to say, listen, that there is always a prophetic trumpet call for revival. Always. When John the Baptist was asked, who are you? He said, I'm the voice of one crying in the wilderness. Make straight the ways of the Lord. That's a trumpet call. The religious leaders had come to a misunderstanding of God and his ways. They had a wrong perspective about God. And uh, what was God's answer to his witness being deemed in the earth? You know, the church has become religious through the years. We, we've done things the same way and everything. But God is a God of change. God is a creative God. He's doing new things. And uh, he raised up a prophetic voice called John the Baptist, who says, I'm the voice of one crying out in the wilderness. Prepare, prepare the way. And he shouted loud, loud. And he demonstrated that is. And that's what revival is. God is raising a prophetic sound that restores the reality of who he is. And so this Rosh Hashanah worship team, your assignment is to raise a prophetic sound for revival. Hello. Let's pray that they will, they will hear that sound. There has to be a sound. There has to be a song. There has to be a voice that's coming out. Okay, and uh, before his witness goes out in scriptures, God always raises prophetic voice, just like he raised Samuel, he raised John the Baptist, he raised Elijah, you know, different people to sound what he is doing and who he is on earth. And so, revival is a prophetic sound that says, this is who God is. God is breaking our norms. He wants to reveal himself to us. And so most revivals will carry a prophetic sound. And it will have a prophetic emphasis that declares who God is. And so now, you know, the world, if you look at the world, there is an antichrist agenda that tries to extinguish the lamb and the light of God. And uh, to remove the idea of who God is. You look at America. You look at uh, 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 Asia. You know, you look at communist China, Russia. They all are trying to remove the idea of God from the earth. But God says, 
my voice and my sound shall not be silenced. I am coming back. I am coming back. Jesus is coming back. Say to one another, Jesus is coming back. Okay. And so what will happen when revival touches society? Um, I'm hoping to go to Barrio next year because that's the place where a revival started for uh, 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 Sarawak. Uh, because uh, I, I think we need to redig the wells of revival. The unfortunate thing, okay, the fortunate and the unfortunate thing, you know, they are trying to preserve and commemorate the revival of 73. So they pray, you know, they pray. But they are praying for the same thing to happen. And it doesn't work like that. <coughs> we cannot bind, tie God's hands. God is not going to work the same way as he did 50 years ago. He's doing a new thing. He's bringing a new sound. So we need, folks, your bell, we need to release the sound of revival. Okay? And it's coming. Can I just... <coughs> Excuse me. Re, uh, I present to you what revival was like in the first 300 years. That sets the base, okay? So that we know what we should expect. And I'm only taking it from Acts 8 and Acts 19. When revival comes, it started in Jerusalem, Pentecost, right? Uh, the church was born. And the church was in revival for 300 years until Constantine comes in. How do we know? Because the, there, were, there was massive numbers of salvation. People were coming to know the Lord. It's something. We want revival, don't we? We want our friends to come to know the Lord. And uh, people will be queuing up to ask, who is this? What is he doing? We want to be touched. And uh, that level of conversion is not one or two. It's... It is hundreds and thousands coming into society, into the church. And uh, that itself will change society. Okay? Because the whole issue in the early church, if you look at the early church, they put them in house churches. It's little groups that were instrumental to sustain and propagate that revival. Right? And, uh, and so, their worldviews will become, uh, will, were being changed. Just imagine, half of KK comes to know the Lord. What will happen? It's a revival here, right? But their mindsets will be changed, correct or not? That is, hello, provided we disciple people rightly. And that's what the early church did, isn't it? So, it caused a shift in the way culture looks at things. So, lots of people coming to know the Lord. Tell one another it's happening. It's going to happen. Really, it's going to happen. I have no doubt about it. Because God is asking us, last year for a reset, means He wants to do it again. Okay? And it's a different way. And then when revival comes in Acts 8, it says, there's great joy. Philip came to Samaria, right? Great joy came to that city. Okay, look at it. Philip came down to the city of Samaria, preached Christ. Multitudes, wow, the whole Samaria was shaken. And with one accord, he did the thing spoken by Philip, hearing and seeing the miracles which he did. For unclean spirits, crying with a loud voice, came out of many who were possessed. Many who were paralyzed and lame were healed. And there was, altogether, great joy. In the city Great joy Because people are being set free There is liberty in the air The good news is being proclaimed So as the kingdom of God Made entrance into that city Lots of people were set free From the occult, from witchcraft and all that And so as a result The kingdom of light Has penetrated into society Now will it sustain Depends on the church those who had lived very hopeless lives began to be filled with hope again. And there's joy, there's hope, there's expectation. And it's like the glory of God has come into the city, causing great joy. Amen? You believe it for KK? I can believe it. 
Okay. Then in Acts 19, now I go to Acts 19 now, okay? These are certain signs that are very clear. You can see that all over the place. There is a renouncing of witchcraft, just like we break the occult just now, okay? Uh, Acts 19 talks about Apollos arrived in Ephesus, preached the gospel, 12 people uh, received the word. But they were not baptized in the Holy Spirit until Paul came. And, uh, and they were then, and subsequently baptized in the Holy Spirit. God began to move mightily in Ephesus. And then verse 19, you can read yourself. Many of those who had practiced magic brought their books together and burned them in the sight of all. They counted the value and it totaled 50,000 pieces of silver. So much money. It is about uh, 50,000 pieces of silver. A lot of money there. Two million. Yeah, two million. Yeah, in those days, uh, calculated equivalent today. Equivalent. You know, that is how much has been given to the account every season, every festival. And they burn them all. And so, it was a very clear sign. The renunciation of witchcraft practices, a turning away from the past practices of worship and uh, separating themselves to worship God is a very clear sign that revival has come. And this is massive, all right? And it happens in Ephesus. When society begins to be impacted with revival and lots of people are being touched by the whole whole by the Holy Spirit, the whole of society will exhibit signs of change. And one of these signs is that the account has been broken. How do we know? Because they will ask you, hey, uh, uh, can you come and deal with the altar in my house? Can you come and burn, uh, uh, take away the red shrine in my house? Uh, can you come and uh, 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 burn up uh, the, the jimat jimat that we have? And... You know, all these things will be happening. And it will be massive because it changes the whole atmosphere. The sign of the occult being broken. Then I like this one. Okay? So you've got lots of people coming to know Christ. You've got the whole atmosphere and the city is changed. Great joy, great liberty and all that. Then signs are being given. There's a clash of the kingdom. The occult power is being broken. But the, the best thing is the Word of God begins to rule society. Now, hello. This is important. Verse 20, just now I read. Verse 20, so the Word of the Lord grew mightily and prevailed. This is key for revival to go on, to perpetuate. Why were they separating themselves from witchcraft? Because the word of God was cutting into society, cutting into their belief system, cutting into their culture, and uh, they are adapting themselves to what God is doing. The word of God has to be the foundation, you know, the guideline and the stability of our belief and our practices. So instead of serving the powers of darkness, the word of God began to prevail. You know, when the word of God is rightly taught and preached, something happens to society. People's mindsets are being changed and uh, society is being influenced. Even today, in our antichrist cultures, uh, it, through the media, entertainment and all that, we so need the word of God to cut through, right? We need the power of the word. And so when revival hits and the word is being preached powerfully, it affects culture. And culture begins to change and comes into alignment with the word of God. That's what happened in Ephesus. That's why the, the occult was being uh, publicly burned, you know, occultic books. The powers of Satan are being broken. The power of God will take its place. And so it's my prayer that we will skillfully cut in, allow the word of God to cut in and prevail in society. And so I want to prepare my, uh, your bell, you know, 
I don't want to prepare you when you are in the midst of revival. We are asking you to be in personal revival. We are asking you to understand when revival hits us, what will happen. All these things, according to the word, 300 years of revival. Probably nothing pomp and ceremony is all happening behind the scenes. Things are happening. Maybe the media didn't pick it up, but God picked it up. You know what I mean? Ah, 300 years of revival because they were cutting in with the word of God. And so my challenge for you is, are you taking in the word of God? We better do. Or else we cannot catch up. Can I give you another challenge? Are you memorizing the word of God? I tell you, I, I'm catching up with memorizing. Cannot catch up. Every new verse, I just put it in. Every new word, I put it in. I just wanted to be filled with the word of God so that when I need to use it, it comes up. Can I challenge you? Read the word of God. Hear the word of God. Study the word of God. Memorize the word of God. Meditate on the word of God. Right, when revival happens, what will happen? Okay, let me just give you some signs. Uh -huh. This comes from Barrio, Bakalalan, uh, KK, Sabah. It will happen. It's just whether it gets reported. How do we handle? You know, it, there will be when revival, when the Holy Spirit hits us, different people will respond differently, will react different. Remember, there's a clash, a kingdom encounter. Light has come in, power encounter. So some people will weep, some people will shake, some people will cry, and some people will be falling down, and some people will be laughing. And, uh, you know, during the Toronto revival, people were barking like dogs. And so a lot of people write them off immediately. Now, let me just share my view on that. There are two different reactions. The first reaction is we totally reject everything because they are barking like dogs. They're shaking like, I don't know what, like the, whatever is happening. Uh, we, we totally write it off because of the manifestations. And so we miss out on the fresh blessings and the deeper things of God. Folks, if we shut it off, it will go off. I'm not prepared to do that. Because I want revival to go to its intended destination. Then there is another reaction. You just receive everything, everything without discernment. Now, that will also be difficult. And uh, then we are in danger of being deceived by Satan and misled by the flesh. Every revival has that. Even now, in society. In any revival, God is at work. Everybody say God. <laughs> then, humans and fleshly responses is also. You know, when God hits you, you respond in every different way. Some of you will shout, some of you will sing, some of you get drunk in the spirit or whatever it is. And in every revival, the devil is at work too. He is taking every opportunity to stop and to thwart and to deceive. So how do we discern? Do we look at the manifestations and we judge the revival by the manifestations? I really believe no. Uh, I feel that, let me just talk about the Toronto revival. When the people began to shake and uh, began to bark and all that thing, I actually feel that God is shaking from people everything that they have been oppressed on in all through the, uh, the, the decades. You know, if you've been in very religious settings, you just want to be set free. And your, your bodily response is unique to you. And uh, so God wants to wake us up, to shake us up, to purge us, to renew us. And unless we are willing and yielded to the Holy Spirit, even with our fleshly responses, we're not going to get there. And that's where leadership comes in. And uh, so all kinds of responses will happen, okay? We can't stop them. 
Satan will be very active. He will take every opportunity to confuse, to deceive, and to spoil what God is doing. And so what is the, how do you test whether that manifestation is good, is of the Lord or not? <laughs> you know, a lot of people criticize Bill, Bill Johnson about Bethel. You know, uh, Bill Johnson allows uh, the Bethel students to go to the graves of uh, different people, uh, different prof prophetic people, because they wanted to ignite and they want to tap into the anointing of the path of these prophets and all that people say they worship at the graveyards they are not Bill Johnson never stop it I will do the same I will watch over that like a hawk what is happening why are they doing that what is coming out of that instead of stopping it if we stop it we will never know the result that comes out of it and so, it's not the test, it's not the, the presence of strange behaviours, but the fruit of changed lives. Isn't it right? A tree is known by its fruit, the Bible says. Some tests, are people more in love with Jesus? Do they get to love Jesus even if they, 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 they show strange behaviours? Are they hungrier for the word? Are they turning away from their sins? Do they have a new desire for prayer and holy living? Do they have a new burden to bring others to Christ? Those are the tests. Okay? We must allow time. Some people need to shake, shake, shake for a long time. You know, Heidi Baker lies on the ground for many hours. And when she woke up, she was so changed. She went to Mozambique to obey the Lord and change Mozambique for Christ. She lay on the floor, people closed the door, she's still there. We must allow that, isn't it? Don't disturb what God is doing. What we want to do is to look for what's the fruit that comes out of their lives. What happens after 6 to 12 months? This is where follow-up discipleship is is there continuing growth and change in lives? Is Jesus still the center? That's important, isn't it? No, we, we, do, uh, we do the calendar of God. The calendar of God is a lot of it in the Old Testament. But everything in the Old Testament needs to be seen through the prism of the cross. Everything goes through the cross and the cross changes and gives hope for every situation. Jesus must be the center. Okay, so I look at phenomena. I look at what revival is in the word. Some of these, you know, they don't talk about the strange phenomena, but I'm sure there are a lot. People get drunk in the spirit and all that thing. Then I, I just wanted to present to you some phenomena because it will happen, okay? Then Ian Mullins write about three main phases of revival. Look at that. In his book, Prepare the Way for Revival, that's the book. Pastor Lam has got this book and he loaned it to me. I find it so interesting. He says, as we look at revivals of the past, we often see three main stages, phases. And it is through these phases, God is bringing about his purpose to bring the church, number one, back to hell and effective witness. God is interested in restoring the church first. First, first one, three phases, huh? It's times of refreshing. He uses the same passage. It's Acts 3.19. Repent. Because times of refreshing is coming. This is like the Holy Spirit coming as rain upon dry ground. A, a time of spiritual refreshing. And the Holy Spirit comes and boom, people come under His power and miracles, signs and wonders happen. And there's excitement. There is renewal. There is uh, new things happening. And uh, miracles are happening. And uh, lots of things are happening. Worship comes alive. Prayer comes alive. The gifts of the Holy Spirit are released. And uh, the, during this phase called the refreshing phase, God awakens us to who we are in Christ. Say to one another, refreshing. refreshing. 
is coming. Yeah. The first phase of revival is when the Holy Spirit comes, boom, and there is. You know, everybody gets refreshed. And we see the cross in a new way and realize how precious is the blood of Jesus that cleanses us from all sin. We experience his closeness. We see signs of his power. And so, this phase is probably the most obvious phase. It, it pulls the church out of its run. Hey, come on, don't stay in the past. It rouses the church from her sleep and sets her in motion, preparing her for what God wants for the next phase. Then, for revival to hit long, it needs to move in the next phase. Most of the time, it stops at phase one. The refreshing, all the signs and symptoms and manifestation. And we are so, so happy, right? And we stay there. That's not the way. If you stay there, it will, you will die there. It's just like a river. It needs to move, right? And so the second phase, revival needs to fit, move into a time, I call it time of maturation. Ian Mellins calls it a time discipline, discipline. In the second stage, God awakens us to who he is, which leads us to deeper repentance and cleansing. He now calls us to holiness. Holiness means set apart for God, obedience and intimacy. And God's purpose is to move the church into maturity. Right? It's like a little child. You need to grow. You need to mature. You cannot stay there enjoying all the benefits of childhood. He wants to shift our attention from the gifts, the gifts of the Holy Spirit to the formation of character through training in holiness. And that's what we need to focus on. Okay, He wants us to be established in his word to keep us from extremes and from errors and to train us in right living. Isn't that God? Isn't it? That's what happened to the early church. Remember in Acts 8, you know, the revival, actually the revival happened in Acts 2. Then it, it starts to go. Now, then God put Acts 8 in. If Acts 8 didn't happen, the revival could have died in Jerusalem. But Acts 8 happened. It went to Samaria and to all different parts. Right? And so, in the midst of revival, hello, are you ready? There is persecution. The enemy is never happy. It will come in different ways. But we must know that this is time to establish ourselves in the Word. And I want to encourage you, get established now, not then, no time then. Start to get into the Word and uh, enjoy the Word. If you don't enjoy the Word, ask Him for a love for the Word. His purpose is to mature us so that we seek Him for who He is rather than what He gives to us. He wants us to become like Him. Say to one another, like Jesus. Yes. And so the, the key thing is obedience to Jesus. And uh, we need to learn to obey Jesus. And uh, it will come out in holy living. Okay? Revival must always lead us into holiness of life if it is to endure what the Holy, what the Spirit, because the Spirit is the Spirit of holiness. And so God's concern, I like this. Hey, God's concern is to make is not to make you happy, to make us holy. Holy means set apart, to be like Him. He's more concerned with my character, your character, than with our comfort. Not to satisfy us physically, but to perfect us spiritually. That's God. The space of maturation. The shaping of our character takes th place I want to say that this is going to be very, very clear because it's in the context of persecution. You know, look at the early church. They were persecuted, right? And in the end times, we are going to be persecuted. And uh, 
And so the disciplines of the Spirit must be put into place. God needs to shake us out of all that is not Christ-centered. Everything, worldliness, idolatry, secret sins, human control, disunity, He needs to shake us out. And His purpose is to perfect us and prepare us so that we become the bride of Christ ready for the bridegroom to return. It's a season of humbling, confession, repentance again, a time of purging and refining. It's a period of individual reformation, church reformation and change. It means discipline and discipleship. We may not like that, but that's necessary, absolutely necessary. And if the church does not follow Jesus through, revival will die. The move of God will dry up. It's God's river flowing. Okay? So the history of revivals is full of examples of moves of the Spirit that did not last, ended up in disunity, false teaching, excesses, and a falling away. We are learning from history. We are learning from one another. So, three phases of revival. Let me recap, and then I'm going to end soon. The first phase is times of refreshing. Revival is refreshing. Ah, well, ah, siok, 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 siok. Very siok. But then, second phase, it must move deeper. Cannot stay in shock. Okay? Correct or not? Right. It moves into a, a, a phase of maturation, discipline. And God is restoring our first love. He's shaking out whatever that is not of Him so that we can move into the third phase. Are you ready? The third phase is the phase of harvest. Amen? Look at the early church, right? They were not a friend of persecution. They were not a friend of anything. And uh, if revival begins in the church, it must end in the world. Revival cannot stay in the church. That is not enough. The overall purpose of God for revival is to prepare His bride to obey Jesus' call to make disciples of all nations. Revivals must result in a healthy, strong church that has an influence on the lives of unbelievers and on society. If revival does not affect society, it has not gone to its intended destination. And, uh, and that's where I'm driving towards. It must always bring God's people to the place of witness, mission and harvest. So, Next session, I want to talk about how to steward. I'm actually talking about the apostolic and the prophetic. How to steward the move of God. Then the final session, I want to look at how it affects society. Biblically, what does God say? Okay? And so God brings revival, not for the enjoyment of His people, but for the glory of His name and the extension of His kingdom. And so the focus of this third phase, the harvest, will be as Jesus is King and Lord of the earth. And so, Jesus will begin to, remember He's the head of the church, a fresh awakening to each of our divine calling and task, and that is to disciple nations, to reach the nations with Jesus. It's Matthew 28. And He's going to give us a new passion and concern for the lost around us and the unfinished task beyond our borders. And so, the late Bob, uh, sorry, I forgot his, Bob, the, the prophet, uh, uh, Bob Jones, Bob Jones, you know, he has a dream of a billion people coming in, in an end time harvest, billion. Eh, nothing is impossible with God, isn't it? We must add to that billion. A global harvest with thousands born daily to the kingdom of God, sparking a fire 
pray, that prayerfully will continue to burn until Jesus returns. That fire revival burned for 300 over years. Quietly, but very clearly, steadily. And so, I want to finish today. Uh, worship team, get ready. Let me summarize. I started with looking at, from the, from, from the word, from Acts. Acts is the book of revival. From Acts, what kind of things will happen in revival? Now, this is not exhaustive. I'm just picking up significant things. Lots of salvation. Great joy and liberty. A renunciation of witchcraft. Lots of deliverance and healing. Supernatural. But, um, but ultimately, we must allow the word of God to prevail. We must preach the word, teach the word, and uh, use the word to cut in. Uh, this is what revival should be looking like so that it can have a chance to sustain, go to its intended de uh, destination. Then we look at some physical phenomena that will happen, right? Fleshly responses. They are not wrong. They are just flesh. Okay, different people will respond differently. So the important thing is not to look at the manifestations, but to look at the fruit. Then we look at three main phases of revival. I think this is very helpful for me. When I understand what God wants to do, the river that starts from the church should actually flow into the sea of humanity, into society, and make changes there. And that's what we are going to consider. Okay, there's a refreshing phase, there's a maturation phase, and there's a harvest phase. And then, so now, I want to finish. I thought a long time about this. How do I respond? How would I respond? And I didn't want to give any gimmicks. So now, I want to say, number one, be equipped. I want to use all the B, B, B. Every Baptist says B, B, B. Three Bs. The first one is be equipped. Uh, Sophia uh, 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 coined this phrase, D and D. What is D and D? Discipleship and decentralize. We don't want to build a mega church. Revival cannot handle mega church because persecution will come and stop everything and then everything will go off, Right? Uh, but there are times for celebration. But God is, you look at the early church, it's the house churches that proliferate. <laughs> Yesterday, I visited Kota Belut, and uh, uh, we went to, uh, uh, to, to look at uh, Chrissy's homeland, ancestral land, her mother's place. And uh, we wanted to explore, uh, is that a place during end times for Chrissy and her family. And we feel very good. Her land is next to uh, her uncle's land. Chrissy's mother has got eight siblings. All of them got land. Hey, radical thing, huh? The parents, in tribal culture, you don't give land to, to girls. You only give to boys. But in Chrissy's mother's generation, the boys, huh? the boys, the three boys, decided to parcel some land to the girls, their siblings. So Chrissy's mother got land. You got the idea? You got the idea? They are not supposed to receive. Girls not supposed to receive ancestral inheritance. But their boys, their, their, Chrissy's uncles, decided to give land to the sisters. So Chrissy's mother has got land. She built a house on it. So we went to visit the mother yesterday. Then the uncle asked us to dedicate his land next to it. Wow, I say, okay. Why us? <laughs> he says, I've always been interested in what is happening in your midst. And uh, so at the end, before I went away, you know what I say? I say, sir, are you worshipping in any church. <laughs> it, it makes him very uncomfortable. He says, I'm trying to get back into Taginambu church and all that. You know what I say? Don't. Don't. Why don't you start an ecclesia here? His eyes nearly pop out. 
Stand in Ecclesia here, right at this place where your land is because there are people coming in. His eyes pop up and all I ask is you need to align. You cannot survive alone. Why don't you align with the TC pastors? Wow. Wow. This is decentralized. I want to encourage your bell to start churches, ecclesias all over. I'm encouraging Chrissy, Chrissy, start your ecclesia. You know who's, who are going to be in ecclesia, Chrissy's ecclesia? Chrissy, who's going to be in your ecclesia? Your children, that's right. Her children. You're, you don't need to be big. You need to be God. Right or not? But you need to be connected for life flow to come in. And that's what God is doing all over the world. He's setting us free from religious structures and how we should be doing things. But listen, we need to be connected. We need to be connected with apostolic centers for life flow. Individual ecclesias will not last if they are not connected. That's our next course. And so, I want to encourage you folks, if you have never been discipled before, because if you have not been discipled, you cannot disciple others. Serious. I would suggest, ask to be discipled. Uh, discipling is to help somebody get established in the faith. Okay? And then decentralize. Wherever God sends you, you start something of God. But you need to be connected, okay, for life to come in. The second one is my major one. Okay, the first one is be equipped, D and D. The second one is what God spoke to us. You know, in 2014, God says to this house, I want you to become an alarm clock. I didn't understand it. I didn't understand it. Alarm clock is to awake, to wake, to alert, and to announce, hey, it's time to wake up, time to wake up, time to wake up, right? And uh, it's like the shofar. The alarm clock and the shofar are the same. Same purpose. Their purpose is the three A's. Awake, to wake people up, alert people to what is coming, and to announce what God is doing. And so I believe that God is calling us in advance. We are a first fruits of what He wants to do. Say to one another, be an alarm clock. Yeah. So you need to know what you are awaking people for. The better word is be a shofar. Say to one another, hey, you are a shofar. That's right. You blow the shofar, you are waking up. You're announcing the arrival of the king. And remember, when big harvest comes, persecution is sure to come. End time harvest is always accompanied by great persecutions. The Antichrist will arise and, and all that. But we must not be afraid. If we are equipped rightly, we will be okay. Right? So the first B, B, be equipped. Equipped with what? D and D, right? So you need to be part of an ecclesia. No choice. If you don't, know, don't have one, please come see us. <laughs> we recommend you one. You, you look, uh, we, when we talk to Chrissy, Chrissy, start an ecclesia. Her eyes nearly pop up. Who? I say, yeah, your ding dong. It's true, isn't it? Her ding dong becomes her part of her ecclesia. So I'm saying to Chrissy, start an altar, an ecclesia at your house in KK now. And when you come out during the weekends, be an ecclesia here too. Because God will show you things. Ecclesias are lighthouses for people to come in. Okay. Secondly, what is it? Be alarm clock or the shofar, the trumpet is awake, announce, alert. Now let's see, I use the word beseech. The word beseech means ask. I want to be, be, be. 
Beseech means to ask earnestly, to plead and say, God, if revival is going to come, you need to heed the majority people group. You know, for those of you who are new, uh, majority people group are the people uh, who have come into Sabah uh, since the 70s. You know, uh, statistics, uh, statistics says the registered statistics is 44%. 44%. The strangers and the, uh, 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 who, are here, who are in our nation, registered, documented, okay? 44 point. Uh, 43.4%. 43.4%. I'll give you the statistics. Unregistered, easily over 50%. And so the term we have devised, don't call them strangers, don't call them aliens, don't call them that. Call them majority people. Because they make up the bulk of Saba. And if we don't ask for revival to hit these people, look, our next generation is not going to have much chance. <coughs> Sabah will be very, very different. But if God comes in and begins to hit revival in Sabah, we have a chance to become what God calls us to be. But for that process to take place, we need a lot of healing. We need a lot of reconciliation with the majority people group. You ready? Are you ready? The three Bs. What is our response? My response, my number one response is, I want to be equipped. Lord, equip me. How many of you are with me? Let's ask the Lord to equip us. Put up our hands. Hi, hi. Say, Lord, equip me. You know, I may station myself to pray. I may station myself to cook food for other people, but equip me so that I disciple other people. Hey, wave to me, wave to me, wave. I just want to have an indication. Good. The second B, be a shofar. Sound the alert. Sound the alarm. Tell people Jesus is coming back again. Again, wave to me. Yeah, Lord, make us a sign and a wonder. And the last one, I think the last one is going to be the difficult one. Lord, give me a heart. For the majority people group, I don't love them. I prejudice against them. They have hurt me. They've stolen my things. But Lord, if that's what you want, Lord, I want to beseech you that you will give me wisdom and understanding for the majority people how to reach this. Are you ready? Wave to me. Come on. Let's go for it. I want to end up with, uh, with one story and then the worship team is going to take over. Last week, I was preaching in Vineyard. I was speaking about the three great uh, things that are happening to Malaysia. I end up with the majority of pe people with statistics. At the end, I, I, I just pray. One lady came up to me in tears. Chinese lady. She says, Many years ago, many, many years ago, she didn't understand. She says, when you talk about the majority people, I understand now. You see, many years ago, I was, I was in a situation and I saw the majority people. You know, these people, they were doing all kinds of wrong things. I, she saw it with her own eyes. <laughs> and she starts to cry. She starts to cry. She never understood why she cried. She said, Pastor, as you come and talk to me, to us about the majority people today, I understand why I cry. I'm crying for them because they didn't know what they were doing. They had no hope. They have no future. And as she, she talked to me, she began to cry and cry and cry. And I believe that's the core of God for us today. If you love God, you need to love what He loves. He loves everyone. Even those people who have hurt us, who have backstabbed us, who have robbed from us, who have burgled from us. For revival must hit them.
The revival must hit the untouchables. The revival must hit every sector of society because Jesus is coming back again soon. Shall we rise? Let's lift our hands to God and say, God, come and visit our land. Lift your hands high, high. Lord, we lift our hands towards you. We want to connect with heaven for heaven's heartbeat for us. Lord, come and visit us. Lord, come and deal with us. Give us a heart of humility and compassion. Help us to love what you love. Help us to see what you are doing. And so in Jesus' name, I open and break every veil that is blocking us from seeing what you are doing. In Jesus' name, I release the compassion of God, the vision of God, the glory of God, the heart of God for all of us so that we can become first fruits of this end time harvest. In Jesus' name, Amen. <laughs>